Welcome, everyone. My name is Autumn Hume. I am the account director with the Muscular Dystrophy Association's Healthcare Partnerships team. Thank you for joining us today for the MDA Industry Update webinar, Vivgar University, presented by Argenix. MDA's Industry Update webinars are programs which provide an opportunity for the community to receive information and updates impacting care and treatment directly from pharmaceutical, biotechnology, and medical equipment companies. These webinars are just a part of MDA's education resources. We encourage you to visit the community education pages of mda.org. You will find an abundance of resources, informative recorded webinars, and listings for upcoming educational events. Of course, if you have questions or need assistance, the MDA Resource Center is available to you by email at resourcecenter at mdausa.org, calling 1-833-ASK-MDA-1, or you can reach the Resource Center on mda.org. Now, I would like to turn it over to Sarah Boring, Senior Manager, Global Patient Advocacy at Argenix, who will introduce the speakers for today's webinar. Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Autumn. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, as Autumn has said, uh, welcome to today's Vivgar University program, sponsored by Argenix. Um, I will be facilitating today's program. We will be hearing um, first and foremost from a patient ambassador, followed by a presentation covering generalized myasthenia gravis and information about Vivgart. Before we get started, I just want to share a few important housekeeping notes. Um, please submit all questions that you may have using the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to address as many of your questions as possible at the end of the program. And that goes for both um, our patient ambassador and Dr. Droker. Please remember to keep your questions general so that they benefit the entire group. Uh, and if you do have more specific questions, please follow up with your own healthcare provider. So today we will hear from two speakers. Dr. Brian Droker will share information about uh, GMG, and treatment with Vivgart. And, but before we get started with Dr. Joker's presentation, we're gonna hear from our patient ambassador living with MG, Doug. How's Good it going? Afternoon. Doing going well. Um, I wanna thank Argenix for sponsoring me to share my story this afternoon. Um, I am a patient living with anti-ACHR, antibody positive generalized myasthenia gravis and being treated with Vivgart. Well, Doug, thank you so much again for being here. I have a couple of questions for you this afternoon about your journey to diagnosis, as well as your treatment experience and insights you have for other GMG patients who are joining us today. Uh, first and foremost, how would you describe the first time you started noticing your GMG symptoms? Well, I remember it very clearly. Um, I had um, stepped into my mo uh, former role um, as a nurse executive in 2017. And I remember very vividly being at a dinner with a number of colleagues at a conference that we were attending. And we were enjoying an evening meal and I suddenly developed extreme fatigue in my jaw. I found it hard to chew and was unable to finish a meal. That had never happened to me before, and food and meals have always been one of my greatest pleasures. To not finish a meal was very memorable. The fatigue continued, but I felt there was nothing significant of concern at the time. I would often avoid eating outside our home um, so that no one saw the challenges I was having and asked why I didn't finish a meal. I was grateful for protein drinks at the time. At home, my wife was aware of my challenges and altered meals accordingly. However, it got to the point that even chewing mashed potatoes was exhausting for me. Looking back, I remember there were times that people would intermittently comment about my eye drooping. But once again, I dismissed that as no concern. I didn't make a connection between my difficulty chewing and the fatigue I was experiencing um, with my eye drooping. 
However, it was a constant source of frustration. I kept busy with work and I didn't take time to investigate it further. That was until a couple of months later, I woke up not feeling well and again brushed it off and went to work. But once I was there, I sensed some numbness and weakness in the right side of my body. I didn't have the confidence that I had control over my movements. I immediately called my primary care physician and went to his office. My first concern was that I was having a stroke. My exam was normal and the CT and MRI were normal as well. I was reassured I was not having a stroke, but I felt like something was clearly wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about your experience leading up to actually being diagnosed with GMG? Certainly. One of the advantages of working in a hospital is being acquainted with a lot of physicians. I had the privilege of working with, in my opinion, one of the best diagnosticians I have ever known. I decided I should share my health challenges with him in case my symptoms got worse. After talking to him about two minutes, he said, I think you have myasthenia gravis. The thought had never occurred to me. I had heard about it in school, but in a career of over 30 plus years, I had ever only seen one patient with that diagnosis. I scheduled another appointment with my PCP and he did a, an acetylcholine receptor antibody test and my numbers came back high. He referred me to a neurologist for further evaluation and care. He seemed a little skeptical at first whether it was myasthenia gravis. So um, after some initial tests, he had me do as many squats as I could do. I've usually had no difficulty doing squats in the past, but after about 12 of them, I felt I had no control over my legs and muscles. He helped me back into the chair and wanted to do more tests. After he performed another ACHR antibody test, in addition to testing for other serotypes, he confirmed the diagnosis as anti-ACHR generalized myasthenia gravis. He explained to me that it was an autoimmune disease that affects the neuromuscular junction where nerves and muscles meet and communicate. Quite honestly, I didn't know what to think about it at the time. Yeah. Well, can you explain to us or describe to us how GMG really impacts your life today? Well, I was a little older when I was diagnosed. Um, it's not what I had planned for my life as I began to look towards retirement, but I was clear that it wasn't going to control my life. I have changed my pace a little bit and, and take things a little bit slower. I'm not as uh, working as many hours as I used to work, um, and continue to be active in my hobbies. But now I put more time and energy into the people who are important to me. Uh, yeah. So can you also, let's just move into your experience with Vivgar and, you know, tracking your symptoms. Well, there was about a four month period. I went without any GMG treatment and I experienced some of the worst muscle fatigue I could imagine. Um, I went to my neurologist to see if there were any other treatment options available. And he informed me that there actually was a new medication out called Vivgard. He explained that it was a prescription medicine used to treat adults with anti-ACHR, antibody positive, generalized myasthenia gravis. I wanted to learn more about the risks and benefits of Vivgard before we decided on this course of treatment. I was connected to a My Vivgard Path nurse case manager and talked over um, Vivgard with her. I wanted in particular to know about side effects. They gave me a variety of resources to read and familiarize myself with the treatment options, side effects, and um, other concerns. I felt excited about the potential benefits of Vivgard and more informed, informed about the risks. After consulting with my doctor, we decided to start me on treatment with Vivgard plus my current GMG treatment. And can you tell me a little bit or all of us about your experience receiving the Vivgard infusions themselves? 
Currently, my cycles are about two to two and a half months between cycles. Um, the infusion process has been fairly easy for me. Um, I have four infusions scheduled on a weekly basis um, and about two months off in between those infusions. I call a local infusion center the week before to confirm that everything is ready for my appointment um, and, uh, and verify they're ready for me to come in. The infusion takes about an hour or so um, um, with, uh, with the treatment. Um, and I pass the time reading a book, reading emails, those types of things. Um, so it's a, it's a fairly um, uneventful process, fortunately. That's great. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad to hear that. Um, before we wrap up, I just have one qu last question for you. Um, how does it feel to know you found a treatment that works for you? Well, I have to admit I had high hopes that the first time I took an infusion, my symptoms were going to dramatically change. That didn't happen on the first infusion, but over the succeeding infusions in the first treatment cycle, um, I did notice improvements in my muscle fatigue. Swallowing food was less of a problem, and uh, double vision disappeared. Now I feel like I'm managing my symptoms better and I continue to work with my neurologist to monitor my treatment to determine whether I need additional treatment cycles. Well, that's wonderful. I wanna say thank you again so much, Doug, for uh, sharing your story. It's just wonderful to hear about how your, your entire experience is gone. And we're really happy to hear that, you know, Vivgard's working for you. Um, and Doug will be able to answer any of your questions later in the program during the Q&A session. Uh, and now we're going to invite Dr. Droker back to talk more about Vivgar and how it works. So I will throw it over to you, Dr. Droker. Well, thank you, Sarah. And actually, thank you, Doug. That was a, a very inspiring kind of story that you just told. Um, and as a as a neurologist myself, um, who treats a lot of neuromuscular patients, in particular myasthenia, your story is is unique to you, but it's actually a very common story that we actually hear. Um, patients aren't usually that aware of what's going on as their symptoms are starting. They'll hear, or they'll start to feel things like some subtle fatigue, their eyes start to droop, some difficulty chewing and swallowing like you, you described, um, and can go several months if not a year without um, seeking care because they don't understand what's going on. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, we're gonna to start today and um, this is our roadmap today, our agenda. And I do also wanna thank everybody else who is um, listening in and who's asked us to, to present for you guys today because it's important um, to have this conversation talking about uh, a disease process that is uh, close and near and dear to my heart because uh, as a neuromuscular specialist, but also I'm sure to you as well, because you either have myasthenia, you are someone who knows myasthenia, who has myasthenia, or maybe involved in the treatment of their um, of these patients' care. Um, so as you can see, our, our roadmap today, we're gonna to discuss uh, generalized myasthenia gravis, just kind of the disease process, how this happens, and how it's kind of developed uh, therapeutic targets. And then we'll transition and directly start to talk about uh, a first of its kind treatments in Vivgart. Um, we'll discuss some data that, that got these drugs to, to market Vivgart for IV infusion, as well as Vivgart Hytrulo, which is a subcutaneous injection uh, formulation. And then uh, we'll wrap up by talking about how to actually get the patients on treatment and uh, through a patient support program called My Vivgart Path. Um, the, the nice thing about this agenda is it really kind of hits on all the really important parts. Why we're doing this, how this medication works and its efficacy, its safety, but then how do we get the patient the drug? Because if you can't have an efficacious drug and if you can't have a safe drug, then what's the point of even doing this? But more importantly, if we can't get the patient the drug itself, you know, you can have the most safe and, and efficacious drug, but if patients can't get it, then it's again, a useless drug. So we're gonna talk about generalized myasthenia gravis. And what we see here is that generalized myasthenia gravis is a rare and autoimmune disease. It, it affects uh, the neuromuscular junction and as a condition, it causes muscle weakness and fatigue. 
by far the most common form of generalized myasthenia gravis is the serotypes that are positive for anti-ACHR antibody or acetylcholine receptor antibody. And I'm going to show you some, some diagrams of what I mean by this. This accounts for about 85% of diagnoses. Um, it's important to, to differentiate this from the other types of myasthenia gravis, and that's the patients who have seronegative or don't have these antibodies, or the patients who have predominantly ocular or eye-related problems um, for the myasthenia gravis. So a generalized myasthenia gravis patient is someone who has muscle weakness and fatigue that affects more than just their eyes. Oh, excuse me. Um, before we do that, let's take a step back and we'll actually talk about how the body, how, how myasthenia gravis is, is uh, um, manifests in the body and also what is kind of the, the step process of, of how this is working. And it really kind of comes down to uh, uh, something called antibodies. And antibodies are what our body uses to fight off foreign things, whether it be infection from bacteria, from viruses, parasites, or either really any foreign bodies. And the way this works is through a process called an antibody. And our, our, our immune system develops these proteins that have very highly specific and very highly tightly binding uh, proteins that alerts our body that there's something that's going on that's foreign to us. Now, that is how the body normally works. Normally, we fight off infections through these antibodies. But every once in a while, our body starts to develop antibodies against proteins that are actually ourselves. And this is called an autoimmune process or self-immune process. Um, there's five different types of antibodies in our body. They're called IgG, IgA, IgE, IgD, and IgM. But by far, the most common type is the IgG antibody. In the normal ability for us to move, to do something, in our, uh, we have to let our muscles know that we want to move. And this is a direct motor process. The brain has to send an impulse to our body. And as you can see in this cartoon, this is how, how the body does it. So if you start from the bottom and kind of work your way back up to the top of the screen here, you'll see the word muscle. And the way that the muscle gets an, an information that it's supposed to contract is that there's a protein or a, um, a, a neurochemical that's called acetylcholine that gets released from the nerve above. And when the nerve has an impulse and it sends, uh, the impulse gets to the end of the nerve, it will release a chemical, the acetylcholine, which will travel across a, a, um, a space called the neuromuscular junction. And then it will bind to these little field goal, result, uh, field goal kind of uh, depicted receptors. And that's what activates the muscle to tell the muscle to contract. This is how things work normally. So as I mentioned before, antibodies are circulating throughout our body. And for the most part, antibodies are good. These are going to bind to uh, a variety of different um, bacteria, to viruses, to parasites, to different things that are foreign to us. And they attack it, and that tells our body to, to destroy it. Every once in a while, like I mentioned before, we'll have some harmful antibodies. These are autoimmune antibodies. And in particular, there's one that's called the acetylcholine receptor antibody. And when the acetylcholine, uh, acetylcholine receptor antibody is present, one of the places that it can attack is those little field goal posts. And it binds to that and it essentially prevents acetylcholine from being able to activate the muscle. So it's kind of an conceptually pretty under, uh, basic to understand that if you can't get enough acetylcholine to bind to those receptors, you won't be able to contract the muscle and the consequence will be fatigue of the muscle. So looking at this picture, this is sort of how neuromuscular specialists and, and pharmacologists have started to think of how can I devise medical treatments to be able to either have more of the acetylcholine available or activate the muscle directly or prevent those bad antibodies from getting to those receptors and preventing it from uh, uh, harming the neuromuscular junction. 
So let's change gears a little bit before we kind of talk about how um, FIVGART works and let's talk a little bit more about, about myasthenia as a, as a disease process. So as we saw on that last slide, if you can't contract the muscle, it's going to lead to a, a series of different types of muscle weakness um, and potentially fatigue. And you can see here on this list here, there's a number of different things that people present with their myasthenia gravis. And if, and if you recall what, what Doug was mentioning before, you saw there's a number of these things on here that he was experiencing. We saw eyelid drooping, we saw difficulty chewing and swallowing, we saw fatigue from repeated muscle use, but there's also a number of other things that people can experience. Eyelid drooping is very common, difficulty keeping your head and neck supported, uh, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, weakness in the arms and the legs. Sometimes patients have difficulties not just swallowing, but they'll start to choke, and that puts them at risk for things like aspiration and can cause some bad pneumonias. If you take these uh, this list of different um, symptoms that people present, it helps us kind of guide how we can assess how our patients are doing. And one of the tools that we use is this tool called the Myasthenia Gravis Activities of Daily Living Scale, or the MGADL. And I want you to take a quick look at this kind of slide here, and you'll see that this is the types of questions that it will alert me as a neurologist that you are struggling with your myasthenia. And these are the activities that you will experience during your daily life. So talking, chewing, swallowing, breathing, inability to rise from a chair, uh, difficulty brushing your teeth, combing your hair, double vision, eyelid drooping. And this, this tool here, quantifies how much of a problem any one of those issues can have. When we talk about the, the way that Vivgar got a, approved, the driving primary endpoint that we looked at was a change in this MGADL score of at least two points. Now, two points doesn't sound like a lot when you're talking about eight different categories where you can potentially have a score of 24, but I want you to take a look and see if if you, if you think that the difference between someone having some shortness of breath with exertion and two points worse than that is ventilator dependence, or if someone is requiring uh, a gastric tube versus rarely episodes of choking, that's two point difference. So two points is a pretty significant difference. Now, some people will have a variety of different one point changes that can happen. But keep that in mind that you know the differences can be quite dramatic for, from one type of symptom to another. Okay, we're going to change gears again and talk a little bit more about physiology in the body. So I had described that the um, that the way that antibodies work normally in our body is to attack things and, and bind to them. But the way that our body actually is able to have what we call memory for our immune system is that we protect these antibodies. These antibodies are uh, sort of, in a sense, recycled in our in our body through. Uh, you know, as it passes through our blood, bloodstream, it gets recognized by endothelial cells. Kind of, if you take a, a blood vessel and you cut it in, in cross section and look at it, you'll notice that the blood is passing through the red blood cells down the middle. You have a bunch of other things like uh, white blood cells and other proteins, and of course, antibodies. The inner rim of that, red, of that blood vessel is going to be the series of cells that are called endothelial cells, um, which is a fancy way of saying the innermost cell. Um, these endothelial cells, though, have receptors on them that will bind to those antibodies and allow for the antibody to be brought into the cell and held onto so it prolongs its ability to, to last in the body. An antibody normally is broken down when it's circulating through the, blo through the bloodstream and hasn't yet bound to one of those endothelial cells. Now, sorry, I'm going to go back. Um, the, and, or the, the receptor that binds to it is called the FCRN uh, type of receptor. And that particular receptor is going to bind to that antibody indiscriminate what type of antibody it is, whether it's the good type of antibodies that are fighting infections or some of these autoimmune ones in particular, like the harmful acetylcholine receptor antibody. And that is how the acetylcholine receptor antibody, in addition to the other types of antibodies, can last in our, in our bloodstream for so long is that they get internalized and held onto for a while and then recycled back out into the bloodstream to be able to either bind to good things like we want it to, or unfortunately bind to the uh, neuromuscular junction and wreak havoc like it, it does in our myasthenic patients.
So just to summarize generalized myasthenia, like I said before, it's a rare autoimmune neuromuscular condition. It causes muscle weakness, fatigue, and it's that the immune system creates these harmful acetylcholine receptor antibodies in, in generalized myasthenia gravis. And that's what disrupts that neuromuscular communication at the neuromuscular junction. And that our key takeaway is you may experience these symptoms because that neuromuscular junction has been disrupted. All right, let's talk a little bit about Vivgard and why this is an important treatment option in our generalized myasthenic patients. And really, it is a first of its kind treatment. So Vivgard or Fgard Tigamod, as I like to say, is worth about 60 points in Scrabble. Um, sorry, it's not advancing. There we go, now it's advancing. Okay, so Vivgard, an IV infusion or Vivgut Hytrulo, which is a subcutaneous injection, is FDA indicated and approved for the treatment of adults with the anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody positive generalized myasthenic gravis patient. Okay, so it does have a very specific type of indication here. Okay, um, and as you can see here, the way that Vivgard is available is for as an IV infusion or as a subcutaneous injection if it's the Vivgard Hytrulo. Vivgard IV infusion is inserted as a needle into the vein, and the medicine is delivered directly into the bloodstream, whereas the subcutaneous injection is delivered through a layer just beneath the skin and then is absor absorbed eventually into the bloodstream. So I'm going to show you a little video on how Vivgard works. Um, it's a... Uh, let's see, play here. Corey, maybe you'll have to hit play. Let me... Welcome to the human body, each unique and with many tales to tell. We're focusing on one story most folks have never heard, but it may be familiar to you. It's about a rare condition that affects your muscles, which you might know as anti-ACHR antibody positive generalized myasthenia gravis, but we're just going to call it GMG. In this story, we'll share how muscles work, what causes GMG, and how a first of its kind treatment called Vivgard may help. Ready? Let's do this. It all starts with your muscles. Okay, I, I just need you to pull them. That's it. Muscles help you move, but they need the brain to tell them what to do. To understand how the brain and muscles communicate, we need to go deep into your body, to a tiny space between the end of your nerves and the muscle itself, the neuromuscular junction. This is where your brain talks to your muscles. It uses nerves to send instructions in the form of chemical messengers. One of these messengers is called acetylcholine, or ACH for short. The muscle receives those instructions using, you got it, ACH receptors. These instructions let the muscle know exactly what it needs to do. When everything's running smoothly and ACH is getting where it needs to go, we're not even aware of this process. But sometimes things stop working as they should, like with GMG. GMG is an autoimmune disease. With GMG, part of your immune system turns against you and interferes with the brain's ability to communicate with your muscles. But what does that actually mean? As you know, the immune system helps keep us healthy. Antibodies like IgG here play a vital role in providing that protection. Unfortunately, when you have GMG, your immune system mistakenly creates some IgG antibodies that work against you instead of for you. They're known as harmful ACHR antibodies. They cause trouble by targeting the ACH receptors in the muscles. Because these harmful ACHR antibodies can block, damage, and even destroy ACH receptors, some ACH can't reach your muscles to tell them what to do. That's why you may experience the symptoms typical of GMG, which can be serious. So what can we do about these harmful ACHR antibodies? What if there was a way to reduce their number so there were less around to interrupt the brain and muscle communication? Well, it turns out Vivgard may help. To 
understand how Vivgard works, we'll visit another part of the body entirely. Yep, that's right. Give it a... Okay, stay with me now. We're going deep. Heading to your blood vessels and inside the endothelial cells that line them. This is where your body sorts out which things in your blood can be kept and recycled and which should be removed and destroyed. Endothelial cells use receptors too. Take FCRN here. If an IgG antibody connects and attaches, then it'll be recycled back into the body to keep protecting you. But remember, with GMG, you have IgG antibodies, including harmful ACHR antibodies, circulating. Because FCRN can't distinguish between them, it holds onto and recycles both. And this is where Vivgard enters the story. Vivgard is a fragment of an IgG antibody designed to form a strong bond with FCRN in the endothelial cell. With Vivgard keeping some FCRN occupied, more IgG, including the harmful type, remain unattached. The result? Unattached IgG, including harmful ACHR antibodies, are destroyed and removed. Because Vivgard helps your body remove IgG, it may increase your risk of infection. In a clinical study, the most common infections were urinary tract and respiratory tract infections. Most infections in participants on Vivgard were mild to moderate. Additionally, more patients on Vivgard versus placebo had blood side effects that were mild to moderate. Your healthcare provider should check you for infections before, during, and after treatment with Vivgard. So, Vivgard works to reduce the amount of circulating IgG, including harmful ACHR antibodies. That means there are fewer harmful ACHR antibodies at the neuromuscular junction, resulting in less disruption between the nerves and muscles, and the symptoms of GMG can be reduced. It's been a journey, and hopefully you better understand GMG and how Vivgard may help. Talk to your neurologist to see if Vivgard is right for you. probably go ahead and move forward. I always love that video because um, it really kind of hopefully brings uh, kind of what we had just talked about to in a kind of more uh, like a video perspective that hopefully people can understand in another way. Um, so as the video also alluded to is that Vivgard being its first of its kind FDA approved treatment uses the fragment. So if you recall that antibody normally has this kind of Y shaped component to it and the kind of the legs part of the of the antibody can be is this fragmented portion that they that uh, Argenix was able to develop that could basically block up and uh, uh, tie up those endothelial receptors and as a, in essence allow more of the antibodies to stay in the bloodstream to get broken down like we nor naturally do and not have the antibodies get recycled. And this is sort of a cartoon depiction of, of how the Vivgard sits in those uh, endothelial receptors and keeps more of the, the IgG antibodies, whether it be the good ones or the harmful ACHR antibodies in the bloodstream to be broken down. Now, it is important to remember that since IgG antibodies are important for infection control, if you are removing more IgG antibodies, whether it be the harmful ones or the good ones, this does beg the question of what would happen with our infection risk. And the truth is it does slightly increase and it, um, your risk for common infections, including urinary tract infections and respiratory tract infections. Um, and if that's the case, you do need to contact your, your healthcare provider and let them know if you have a history of, of 
immunosuppression or if you have a history of chronic infections, because that may be a question that you need to discuss with them. Uh, you want to tell your patient, your healthcare provider, whether or not you've had signs or any other symptoms of infection if you're getting treated with Vivgard because of that potential uh, redu reduction of your immune system. So in summary of how Vivgart works, we know that the antibodies that attach to that FCRN, that, uh, that receptor on the endothelial cells, extend the life of the antibodies, and then unattached ones get removed through the bloodstream. That Vivgart will attach to that receptor, essentially blocking the IgG antibodies from being able to uh, bind to that endothelial cell and allows for any of the IgG harmful and normal ones from attaching so they get removed by the body. And then the downstream effect is less of those acetylcholine receptor antibodies being present, the less attacking of the, of the neuromuscular junction that the patients with generalized myasthenia would have. So in, in a clinical study, most common infections that we saw as a result of removing IgG was urinary tract infections and respiratory tract infections. So let's dive into some of the data. And this is how the drug became approved through a trial called the ADAPT study. And this was done with 167 adults who met the following criteria for myasthenia. And the study was done globally. So we looked at a, a number of different places around the world where patients to try to reduce the, the bias of the type of patient that they may be. Um, patients had to be 18 or older. They had to have what we call an MGFA or the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America Clinical Classification 2 to 4, which really tells us the difference is, is that patients who have this MGFA class 1 are strictly ocular patients, and patients who have MGFA class 5 are people who are very severely impacted by their myasthenia. So we wanted to find the patients who truly were generalized myasthenics who had a potential for being able to improve quite a bit. Um, we, if you remember that MGADL score, um, the patients who were in this study had to have a score of at least five. So they had to have their activities of daily living be quite impactful on their life. And then once the patients were on in the study, they were allowed to be on their current therapies uh, throughout the study, whether it be uh, uh, medications that affect the neuromuscular um, acetylcholine receptor antibody, or excuse me, the acetylcholine receptor uh, breakdown enzyme, um, so commonly used as pyridostigmine, um, some other non-steroidal uh, immune suppressant therapies, and then, um, uh, and then they were allowed to stay on those medications. The patients were then studied for 26 weeks, and patients were randomized into one of two arms. They were either given Vivgart or they were given placebo and they were able to stay again with their current treatment. Just to refresh what our MGADL score um, or scale looks like, this is what we used as our, as our tool to be able to see if the patients had improved um, or not. Uh, patients had to score at least five, so they can get scores from all over this type of MGADL scale. Patients could have, say, uh, a point for fatigue with solid food, uh, two points from frequent choking necessitating changes in their diet. Maybe they have double vision that occurs, but not daily, and have eyelid droop that occurs, but not daily, and that would get them to a score of five. But you could see how the points can, can vary from a bunch of different places. And what we noticed was that when patients added Vivgart to their current generalized myasthenia gravis, grav, gravis treatment, we saw that 44 out of 65 patients, or 68% of the patients who were on Vivgart, achieved a improvement in their ability to perform their daily activities. And that was defined as an improvement of a score of at least two points on their MGADL score. In the folks on the placebo arm who were still on their current treatment, only 30% of those folks had achieved two points or better. What we also looked at, now this wasn't the primary thing that we looked at, but other things that we looked at in the study was the reduction in how much muscle weakness. And this was done through a, um, a scale called the Quantitative Myasthenia Gravis Scale, or the QMG. And we saw that 63% of patients, 41 out of the 65, achieved, achieved a significant reduction in the amount of their muscle weakness. Again, this is another type of um, uh, measuring tool that we use, and that was defined as improving by at least three points in that particular scale. Only 14% of patients, or nine out of the 64 patients on the placebo arm, had any reduction of their muscle weakness that was statistically significant. 
what was also noted in this study was what was the reaction to the immune system? And we saw that both Vivgard and the Hytrula study is it can, in fact, impact your immune system. Um, the most common types of reactions that people had, as we noticed in, in the Vivgard studies, was that upper respiratory tract infection, urinary tract infections. But because Vivgard Hytrula is given as a, as a subcutaneous injection, there was a couple of other things that were also noticed, and that was rashes and some swelling under the skin, as well as some shortness of breath. Um, hives were also observed only in the Vivgard Hytrulo part of the study as well. In the clinical studies, reactions were most often just mild or moderate, and usually would recur early in the in the infu um, in the infusion process, so within an hour or up to at least three weeks of it after the administration started. And reactions really did not lead to any uh, patient discontinuation. So that would most likely classify it as a mild or a moderate type of a, of reaction. Data-wise, looking at that MGADL score and seeing how we can look at it graphically, you can see that in the light blue uh, dots and, and lines that the the patients who were on Vivgar compared to the gray and balls and, and, and line uh, graph is the placebo group. You can see how quickly the pa patients improved and after each week of their infusions, you can see how much that, that score had dropped. But when you look at the fourth week, you see that patients who had Vivgart had close to four and a half points lower on their MGADL score from their baseline. When we look at the placebo people, they had about one and a half points at that fourth week. But you know, as we march out and go on further on, what we do see is that, that after uh, the eighth week, those numbers start to get closer to each other again. Some additional data that was helpful for us to be able to understand how Vivgard is working. Patients who were on Vivgard, who got the IV infusion and their current treatment, not only did they have improvement in their MGADL score, but we also saw that several of these patients, 40% of them, 26 out of the 65, actually got to what we call a minimal expression, uh, symptom expression down to zero or one. So whatever their score was before they started the, the therapy got down to a zero or potentially a one on that score. Whereas the folks who were on placebo, only seven out of the 63 patients or 11% of them did. Patients also on Vivgart for IV infusion observed that within two weeks of their treatment cycle, their first time, they had some degree of improvement. That was 84% of the patients. So 37 out of 44. And patients who were on placebo only 16 out of the 19 patients um, had some degree of improvement. In terms of safety, Vivgart for IV infusion was considered to be safe, and this was seen. And if you look at the numbers that were technically above 5% of above uh, um, from of the patients, um, and more than 2% of the ahead, above placebo, we saw respiratory tract infections occurred in about a third of patients. However, in the placebo arm, 29% of patients also had upper respiratory infections. Um, headache was seen in 32%, 29% in placebo, and then urinary tract 10% in the, in the Vivgard arm, 5% in the placebo, and some other, as you can see here, tingling sensation and muscle pain was also seen more than 5% of the time. Questions that we need to ask um, before you start Vivgard or Vivgard Hytrulo, it's very important to discuss with your healthcare provider about other medical conditions, things that you may be on that potentially Im uh, impact your ability to mount an infectious response. Um, uh, if you have a history of infection or you think you might have an infection, it's important to, uh, to discuss with your, with your healthcare provider. Other questions that need to come up that are important is patients who might be um, interested in getting vaccines. Um, you do need to have this discussion with your healthcare provider because age-appropriate immunizations that may have live or live attenuated vaccines, we don't know necessarily the impact yet on Vivgart on these um, types of vaccines. So it's important to have the conversation with, with your doctor or your health, other healthcare provider. And then also knowing um, whether or not you're pregnant or plan to become pregnant, um, we still don't have um, enough data yet, but have that conversation with your healthcare provider if you're planning on getting pregnant or are pregnant, planning to breastfeed or plan or breastfeeding. It's also important to talk to your healthcare provider about every medication that you take. And, and this is a good uh, kind of rule of thumb, but other prescriptions, other over-the-counter medications, vitamins, herbal supplements, these are also things that you need to um, discuss. Um, in terms of drug drug interactions, excuse me, specifically with uh, to be aware for Vivgard and Vivgard Hytrulo, 
is that patients who are on immunoglobulin products, um, other types of monoclonal antibodies, anything else that might have any impact on the FC domain of the IgG receptor or IgG class may be impacted by the VivGuard uh, um, medication or process that happens. So this is something you do want to have a conversation with because suppose you are on a monoclonal antibody that is an IgG type of monoclonal antibody for another condition, um, there is an impact potentially on that, on the effectiveness of those medications. So just to summarize the ADAPT study, oops, sorry, was there someone interrupted? Okay, um, Vivgart for IV infusion um, was evaluated in a global study. It looked at 167 patients to understand its safety and efficacy. Uh, treatment cycles of one hour infusions, as Doug had mentioned earlier, is a very, uh, uh, um, kind of a simple type of infusion to provide. Um, the way I like to think of this over four weeks, it, it is about as much time as you are spending getting your hair done for some people. Um, patients on VivGuard for IV infusion with anti-ICHR antibody positive GMG showed significant improvement in their ability to perform their daily activities, even at cycle one. And that VivGuard is an IV infusion that is safe when treating our patients, but there are some common side effects that we do need to be aware of particularly respiratory tract infections, urinary tract infections, and headaches. Now we're going to switch gears again, um, and this time we're going to speak specifically about Hytrulo, Vivgart Hytrulo, and some of the data that brought this study, uh, or that brought the, the drug to market. Um, and this was done in a, in a study in which patients were either given Vivgart IV or Vivgart Hytrulo, the subcutaneous injection. This was an open label study, so the patients knew what they were going to be getting. Um, and there was 110 patients that were, uh, that were in this study. Um, they had to be, again, be 18 or older. They had to the same MGFA classification, so they had to be generalized myasthenic patients, so a score of two to four, and an ADL score of five or higher. So they had to be people who, again, um, were having impact on their activity of, of daily life. Patients, again, were able to stay on their stable current dosing of whatever other generalized myasthenic gravi gravis treatment that they were on. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, they were in for 12 weeks in either one of the two arms. What we found was that Vivgard Hartrula was found to be effective for adults with both, uh, for folks who have anti-ACHR antibody positive GMG. Um, the, the effectiveness was predicated on the fact that what these studies were looking at was to make sure that if we give Vivgard Hytrulo through the subcutaneous way, can it get to the same amount of Vivgard in our bloodstream? And if it did, then we knew that it was going to have the same sort of effect that Vivgard IV did. Um, we know that the Vivgard IV, again, reduces the harmful acetylcholine receptor antibodies, and that Vivgard Hytrulo has a similar reduction in that same harmful ACHR antibodies that caused GMG as IV formulation did. So what are some of the common side effects we saw with Vivgard and Vivgard Hytrulo? By far the most common side effect that we saw, again, was respiratory tract infections, headaches, urinary tract infection. And that makes a lot of sense, again, just in terms of, of what it's trying to do to the, um, the immune system. And Additional common side effects were done, were noted in the Hytrulo parts of the of the studies was some injection site discomforts that we didn't see that that we we did not see with the Vivgard infusions and that included rash redness of the skin itchy sensation burning or excuse me bruising pain and hives. The safety of Vivgard was then established through these two studies and the most common side effects once again urinary tract infection respiratory tract infection headache and then those additional ones that we saw. Um, with the uh, injection site reactions for the Hytrulo. One other thing to note is that we did see in the folks who got Vivgard IV infusion that they did have some blood changes, um, in, in particular the lower white blood cell counts. However, this was only mild to moderate in its severity. Um, and it is something that you may wanna consider just, just thinking about as, as far as um, if, if you have a comorbidity of, of having low white blood cell counts to discuss that with your, with your healthcare provider. In the Vivgard Hytrulo study and its long-term safety study, the injection site reaction still continued to be mild to moderate. It did occur about 38% of the time in patients. So 21 out of the 55 patients did describe this type of issue, but it didn't lead again to treatment discontinuation. And what that tells me as, a, as someone who prescribes this medication is that 
that the patients, when when you describe these these things, uh, these types of injection site reactions to them, if they're having it, and you can institute some some either topical, uh, um, uh, you know, anti like or injection site reaction type of medications, or if the patients, um, uh, you know, if it's mild or moderate, they didn't want to stop the medication because Vivgart was doing what it was supposed to do in terms of their myasthenia treatment. Majority of these reactions occurred within 24 hours and resolved on their own, but the majority of inje injection site reactions occurred also during the first treatment cycle and decreased with each subsequent cycle. What we also noted was that Vivgart, both for the IV and the Hytrulo study, had a similar type of effectiveness. They improved our daily activities and were able to reduce muscle weakness. Vivgard Hytrula was found to be effective for adults with the same type of auto um, antibody, uh, acetylcholine receptor antibody as, as Vivgard. Um, injection site reactions, again, site rea site, injection site reactions included the rash, the redness of the skin, itchiness, bru bruising, pain, and hives. So getting patients actually started on the medication. So we've, we've discussed in depth how well the medication is effective. We've discussed how safe it can be. And now, how do we actually get the patients the medication? For Vivgard IV, it's a treatment cycle that's four treatment cycles in a, in a per cycle. Um, and it's given weekly. Patients get a, uh, one treatment each week for four weeks. Then the patients have a break between before they get their next treatment cycle. So they get four weeks on, and then they have as soon as the next cycle would be four weeks off, followed by their next cycle. Now, the amount of time between treatment cycles really will depend on how well you respond to the medication. Some patients, they get their first cycle, they do so well that they don't need to have another cycle. Some patients have to get uh, four weeks on, four weeks off, four weeks on, depending on how you and your neurologist or you and your healthcare provider feel you are responding to the treatment. It's given over one hour at an infusion center. It can be done at a neurologist's office, and it can even be done at home. Um, it's been nice being able to have options where patients can have this done at their convenience, and sometimes this depends on their uh, the payer, the insurance, who um, where this gets determined to be done. Whereas Vivgard Hytrulo is a subcutaneous injection that takes about 30 to 90, sec 90 seconds to inject. It has to be done under the guidance of a, of a healthcare provider. Um, again, can be done in an infusion center, can be done in a physician's office, or can be done at home. So there are some opportunities to be able done in different places. The four steps to preparing Vivgard infusion. Uh, the medication needs to be uh, prepared uh, for an IV infusion. You have your vitals checked, including pulse, temperature, blood pressure. You need to find a good vein to be able to put it into. Um, and then patients are monitored during and after their infusion by a healthcare professional. Vivgard Hytrulo, on the other hand, is a five-step process. First, you check into the location where you're going to have it, or they come when they come to your home. Uh, patients are have their insurance um, assessed and made sure that it's correct. Patients then are get ready for their injections. An office member will um, let you know that the subcutaneous injection is ready and then prepared for you at that time. The patients then will receive their injection. It's done over 30 to 90 seconds. Um, it's a, um, as you can see on the left side here, it says not actual size. I really hope that's not the actual size, um, but it's done as, as like a butterfly needle. The patients um, have the, the needle placed underneath the skin um, on your abdomen, um, and then it is uh, provided over a 30 to 90 second um, injection. You're then be monitored for at least 30 minutes after injection just to make sure you don't have one of those types of side effects. And then you're checked out before, um, before you leave and you set up your next cycle. And now I'm going to actually kick it back over to the folks with our, at Jargenix because they're going to kind of talk about how the actual medication um, can be uh, provided to the patients in a way that will allow us to be able to, um, to uh, see how well we're doing and be able to track how we're doing. Um, but before I do that, I just want to say thank you guys for inviting me to, to speak to you. And I hope that you're able to understand and, and learn a little bit about how myasthenia gravis works how Vivgart came to be, and how we're able to use this, this um, both the IV or the Hytrulo formulation to be able to, to really be able to improve our patients' um, myasthenic experiences.
Thank you so much, Dr. Droker. Um, and we only have a few minutes left here. However, I did want to quickly um, go over our My VivGart path. So what's wonderful about uh, being, once you're prescribed and you're, you and your physician have had a conversation and you've gotten a prescription for VivGart, um, you can be uh, connected with our My VivGart path um, and we can connect you to a um, <clears throat> sorry, nurse case manager, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, we will absolutely, sorry, was someone trying to say something? Okay. Um, we're going to play, oh, we're going to play a short video. If that was what it was <laughs> with more information about my VivGuard. We give my VivGuard pack. Hi there. My doctor and I recently decided to start VivGuard, and I had a lot of questions. I found myself wishing I had a little help along the way. So I was happy when my doctor enrolled me in my VivGuard path. Hi there. My doctor and I recently decided to start VivGuard, and I had a lot of questions. I found myself wishing I had a little help along the way. So I was happy when my doctor enrolled me in my VivGuard path, a patient support program that provides personalized support from a nurse case manager and committed support team. A nurse case manager called me and I got a lot of helpful information about my VivGuard treatment, like what I needed to know about the infusion process before, during and after. For instance, the infusions are given in a treatment cycle and your doctor will help to determine your next cycle if it's needed. That was helpful to learn, but everybody's path is different. A friend from my support group wanted to feel more confident when talking to my neurologist about my VivGuard treatment. I want to make sure I could express what's been going on day to day with my symptoms and treatment. A My VivGuard Path nurse case manager walked me through tracking my symptoms, which I'm going to do before my next neurologist visit. With My VivGuard Path, I'm getting both guidance and useful resources like this symptom tracking journal. That's just one of the benefits of my VivGuard path. I'm sure a lot of people wonder about insurance and coverage. My husband is on VivGuard. We had difficulty navigating our insurance benefits and figuring out what our out-of-pocket costs would be. We made a call to our nurse case manager, and they helped to point us in the right direction through the insurance process. And we both really appreciate that. Nurse case managers are also there for you if you have financial concerns. I wondered if I could get any help covering my out-of-pocket costs. So I'm going to speak with a nurse case manager about the VivGuard copay program. If I'm eligible, I may pay as little as $0 for VivGuard and related administration costs. The nurse case manager can also explain my options for other financial assistance programs that may be available. Since my doctor enrolled me, nurse case managers have been able to provide me with support during my treatment journey. Everybody's path is different. And with my VivGuard path, you can get answers to many of your questions. Resources that can help you feel more empowered. Help with navigating insurance. Identifying financial assistance programs that you may be eligible for. And more. If you have a prescription for VivGuard, ask your neurologist to enroll you in my VivGuard path. Once you're enrolled, you'll receive a call from a nurse case manager and get a welcome kit in the mail. Thanks to this program, we're getting personalized support on our VivGuard treatment journey. Ask your doctor for more information about my VivGuard path. All right. So you can absolutely ask your doctor for more information about my VivGuard path. Um, and if we want to go to the next slide, um, a nurse case manager um, is there to help you. Oh, we're going on to my VivGuard app. All right. So what the my VivGuard app is, is a it's a great uh, resource that we give to all patients who have been diagnosed with, um, sorry, MG and have been prescribed uh, with VivGuard. It has your MG ADL tracker right in there, which provides a great opportunity for you to easily track your MG ADL score over time 
um, and provide more efficient communication between yourself and your physician, as well as with your nurse case manager. And it can also help you to manage any comorbidities or other medications that you're taking. And then the next slide, it talks about my VivGart Journey uh, mentorship program, which is uh, something unique, and it allows for uh, patients who are already on VivGart, uh, who have already been through several cycles, uh, to we connect them with patients who are either new to VivGart, thinking about starting VivGart, uh, so that they can share experiences living with GMG uh, and their experience with VivGart. So we'd be happy to connect you um, with other patients who are going through the same thing that you are. And uh, please talk to your neurologist to see if VivGart is right for you. And we encourage people to call uh, 1-833-VIVGART or visit vivgart.com to find out more. You can also use the QR code on the screen. Uh, on that website, you'll also find um, another resource, which is our doctor discussion guide. Uh, we do encourage all of our patients to go through this. It really helps to, you know, if you fill it out prior to your next appointment with your neurologist, you can have conversations, um, be prepared for that conversation. Um, and then you and your neurologist can use that uh, to determine whether or not VivGAR could be right for you. So you can download the doctor discussion guide on vivgart.com and you can also find the link to the DDG uh, in the chat box. Uh, and if you're ready to learn more about vivgart, feel free to go to vivgart.com. Um, so I know we're a couple minutes over time, but I do know that there are a few questions in the chat here. And so for I believe this is for Dr. Droker. Um, do we know the percentage of ACHR uh, antibodies versus the, I'm guessing what they're asking is bad versus good um, antibodies. And does the body produce differing amounts? So it, yes and no. Um, we can measure how the amount of acetylcholine receptor antibodies that a person has. It's not really a ratio of good versus bad um, determining whether or not you have it. It's whether or not they're present, period. Um, if the, um, some labs have different cutoffs, but, uh, um, oftentimes if the level is above, I think it's 0 0.25, um, antibodies, then it does, um, give you the diagnosis of the seropositive acetylcholine receptor antibody. Um, the amount that the body produces, um, can be affected by a number of different things. Sometimes the, uh, degree of stress the body is under undergoing, um, the more, uh, physically active we are, the antibodies start to get produced a little bit more. If your body is immunocompromised for other reasons, um, you start to produce some more um, antibodies or if there's something that stimulates it. So it's not really an actual number or percentage that really um, correlates specifically with how the disease is working. Thank you, Dr. Droker. Um, I believe this next question is also for you. Um, is there a chance that by taking Vivgart, a patient could go into remission for GMG or is the medication for the rest of the patient's life? That's a great question. Um, we do see that when patients are on Vivgart, um, they do get that minimal expression. So they, their, uh, minimal symptom expression, so they can get to zero or ones on their MG ADL. Um, it would be... It would be ideal if we could have this drug be able to put people into remission and never need to get the in infusion again. Um, but the way that the antibodies are produced in our body, you will, especially since it's an autoimmune, so it's going to be, continue to be producing those bad antibodies in addition to regular antibodies. Um, so my suspicion is that you will probably need to be on this type of medication uh, for an extended period of time um, until we can figure out a way to isolate just that particular antibody and not have that one be produced. Um, but uh, um, I also think it's really early in Vivgart's uh, experience in, in the market to be able to know um, if people can actually get to full remission and not need to be on any future infusions. Thank you. Um, and I think this might be the last question. 
Um, does Vivgar sometimes help a patient reduce their use of Celsept and prednisone when Vivgar becomes effective? Yeah, actually, that's that's one of the things that I, I mean, this isn't you know part of the study that they were looking at was being able to see people's reduction. In fact, actually, patients stayed on Celsept and prednisone during the clinical trial, so it wasn't like we were looking to see if those those types of medications were reduced, but. Um, in practice, that is actually what I'm trying to get to is, can we get you off of some of these more toxic medications, ones that, that have interactions with other medications or other metabolic problems? You know, when you're on chronic uh, prednisone, it puts you at risk for bone health problems and GI related issues and, and diabetes and, and um, weakens the immune system in other ways. Same with Celsept. So you know, that is what my goal is to not only get people to have improvement in their activity of daily living scores um, and their quality of life improved, but also hopefully be able to at some point get them off these medications. So that is really kind of what I'm aiming at and discussing with, with patients is like, let's get you onto something that is, uh, seems to be very well tolerated, um, you know, side effects that we can manage, and then also um, maybe get you off of some of the other medications ultimately. All right. Well, thank you all so much for taking the time to join us for this program. Special thank you to you, Dr. Droker, for presenting this afternoon and to Doug for sharing his story. Um, please share your feedback about this program in the program evaluation, uh, which will be linked in the chat box as well. This helps us improve programs for the future. So please be sure to share your thoughts. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.